When Showtime's The Circus came on the air in early 2016, the title seemed almost hyperbolic. We've always considered politics to be a bit of a sideshow, but to call it The Circus uh, seemed a little bit much. Five years after the start of Showtime's hit series, The Circus, the executive producers and hosts continue to expose and give us the most fascinating looks inside the continuing three-ring show that is the American political system. I'm Clay Aiken, and this week, Politicon is excited to welcome Mark McKinnon and Alex Wagner, two people who have closer front-row seats to the inner workings of Washington, D.C. than just about anybody else in America. I'll ask them their reactions to the first week of the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Do they expect any surprises in the coming days? Does anything even surprise them anymore? And how the heck are we going to get along? Where are you then, Mark? Are you in Texas? Or are you? Well, this is, this is funny. This is a good example of how, how one of the most difficult things in the circus is how to pack for the week. I thought I was going to be in Florida all week. <laughs> I ended up in New York uh, with, like my, with my Bermuda shorts and straw hat. <laughs> oh, no, right, because you thought you were going to be, yes. oh, that's that's just not good. Snap, so you I got to I mean, shoot a scene without my hat this, today. That is just, what? oh, my God. People aren't is even going to recognize you. Are you contractually well, allowed to do that? I'm not, and I lose all my power when I don't have it. But the, the good thing is that when, on the occasions that that happens, and it's not very often, all these, I get all these people to weigh in and go, well, we just assumed you were bald. <laughs> no, you've got a fine head on you. Do you yeah, so do you really do you really eat sushi for breakfast? No. Oh hell yeah. Oh do you God. really? Because I noticed I'll that last week. Anytime. Last week's well, episode, you guys were all having like your morning meeting on the phone, and there's Mark <laughs> eating sushi, and I'm like, what the hell? Well, <laughs> Who eats that's sushi because for I'm, breakfast? I'm in uh, I'm in Mountain Time, and they're all on East Coast time, so they're all eating lunch while I'm eating breakfast. And you're having sushi for breakfast. Yeah. It would have made more sense if it was the reverse. But, you know, why? (laughs) Why why be logical about that? So where are you now, Alex? I'm, I just got back to New York. I was in D.C. all week. Is that right? You can, it's like I can barely it's not, The week is not quite done yet. But where, no. you, so were you in D.C. for the beginning of the trial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were there, uh, is that right? It's so funny. Like I literally have to remind my I have to look on my like like my my flight itineraries to remember where I was. Um yeah, I was in DC for the impeachment and now I'm back and we'll probably be going back to DC next week. Although you never know. You well, never who know. Knows if it'll, it may be over. They say they're going to finish. They say that Trump's attorneys are going to be done tomorrow, right? Yeah, I think we're going to try and have some coverage of the new administration at some point. Well, that's what we, I wanted yeah. to ask. Like, what's the top story right now? What's the what's in the center ring of this circus? Is it the impeachment trial or is it the Biden administration? What's the top? What's the big story now? Who's what's more important? Uh, it's Trump. I mean, the, the big question is, is you know, what happens to Trump? Does he remain a force in the Republican Party or not? And and clearly, as a result of this week, he is he is going to be a big centrifugal force in the party for at least the next four years, which is, I think, a big problem for the long term strategy for Republicans because they can't live with him and they can't live without him. Mm. But isn't it fascinating, though, that he's been able to keep that grip. And he's sort of been silent for the last two or three weeks, hasn't he? Has he been talking in back channels? We haven't seen him say anything really publicly, have we? Well, we know what his supporters are saying because they're calling their representatives' offices and they're not happy about the ride, you know, the former president is getting in in Congress. And they've made their opinions uh, known, shall we say. So I think that's what they're hearing. They're also looking at their polling. Um, you know, and it's a problem to, uh, for them to Im- convict the former president. So why is he being quiet? Are. Why do you think, why do we think he's being quiet right now? Because he's being advised to be quiet because the more he opens his mouth, the likelier it is that he actually runs into serious peril, either in terms of Congress or in terms of a criminal trial. But well, let me real. tell you, I am sure he does not want to be quiet. 
Well, but well, the, I would the think he's is, never listened to advice before. <laughs> well, he did. I mean, he, he well, go ahead, Mark. Well, he, he he lost his biggest platform. He's off Twitter, and and that's had a huge impact. I mean, that yeah. that was his microphone, and he no longer has it, and, and it makes. A but huge I mean, difference. he he could call into Hannity. It, he is definitely yes. like no. he is he I mean, has been silenced, but he is also st- being silenced. Yeah, it's a legal strategy for sure. Speaking of legal strategy, does his team have one? <laughs> yeah, they do. They're going to say this was this whole thing is unconstitutional. And oh, by the way, this is free speech. I think that's basically the the essence yeah, of their it, argument. That's it. It's two prong. One is to say you're it's unconstitutional because he's 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 not in office anymore. And, and the whole idea of impeachment is so you can get somebody out of office. He's already gone, um, uh, which is very flimsy, actually, historically. I mean, the whole if if you if you establish that as precedent, that means that any president could do whatever the hell they want in the last couple of months of their presidency and commit any crimes. The whole point is not necessarily to to punish, but to prevent this kind of action from happening in the future. But more pointedly, uh, they're going to make the First Amendment uh, issue uh, defense. So it'll be a First Amendment defense, which is just say he never actually said go commit by and he did go peacefully. That's basically the two things they're going to say. He never specifically said commit a crime or commit violence, and he actually said go in peace. Um, is that a fair argument, though? He didn't that he he didn't specifically say go do violence. I mean, isn't that? I mean, it's, <laughs> well, I mean, Clay, I, he, listen, I I think the whole thing is absurd him. because <laughs> no, no, I want to be very but clear I, about I, this, but me, I want to ask. Devil's advocate. <laughs> to me, to me, it misses the point. And I mean, it's way too narrow for me. I mean, I think, I think actually, the Democrats made a bit of a mistake by not making this bigger and saying the impeachable crime was not what happened at the Capitol. Yes, that, that of course, that was a crime, but it was what led up to that because it was the big lie that he sowed even before the election when he said that if he was elected, it'd be great, and if not, it was going to be a fraud, and then perpetuated that myth despite the, despite the opinion of the Attorney General and his chief elections officer. He knew that he didn't win. He convinced millions of people that he did. He told him to go to the Capitol. And then, he, I mean, he told him to show up in Washington for this speech. And then he told him to go to the Capitol and and not show weakness. And I mean, the whole thing was him trying to overturn a democratically held election. That, to me, is the impeachable offense. Is, but is lying against the law? Yeah, I was going to say, I think the cons- in terms of the, you know, what you can draw up articles of impeachment on, I think they chose the thing that they felt was most open and shut, which is he said this stuff and he said it for months and it culminated on January 6th when he incited an insurrection. And like, it's not, it's not nebulous. It's very specific. There's a lot of evidence and it's very focused. So I think that's kind of what their strategy was. And listen, they though, did a good job. Think- they did a yeah. good job. I mean, across the board, even I talked to Trump's uh, first impeachment lawyer today, and they were all completely laudatory. Anybody with, you know, who's not a complete sycophant uh, and had a- any ob- objective view at all. Do those people still unobject- exist? Well, not many. <laughs> but well, I, I, I mean, listen, this was this was Trump's first impeachment lawyer who was very impressed with the right. with the Democrats' case, and that's what almost everybody said, including Alan Dershowitz, who's you know. Well, they used a lot of Republican words against him. I mean, Jonathan Turley, who said that it was unconstitutional, they pulled straight out of his papers on day one that he straight up said it was constitutional to impeach somebody afterwards. So, I mean, they have done a very good job, but do you, is there, are there any surprises left in D.C.? I mean, did Bill Cassidy's changing his vote surprise either one of you? Yeah, that surprised me a lot. I mean, it surprised me today. I mean, uh, that should have been a surprise, you know, historically. I mean, that's what senators are supposed to do. That's what jurors in a trial are supposed to do, listen to the evidence. He was changed by the evidence, which is very powerful and compelling. But I mean, Alex just informed me we were in a call a minute ago that that Lindsey Graham and Ted Cruz were meeting with the defense team to go over the strategy, and they're supposed to be the impartial jurors. Yeah, yeah but, I mean the idea the idea that they're actually I mean that's it, but that it, isn't they, a surprise, is it? You, well, I mean, I mean it should be because the the Republicans have maintained this notion, which is really just a facade, that they you know, we're going to be impartial jurors and listen to the evidence. I mean, Mitch, how many times did Mitch McConnell say, I look forward to hearing the evidence, I'm an impartial juror? Well, 
I mean, that doesn't work when the jurors are meeting with the defense team and offering them legal advice and strategy the day before they present their case. I mean, it's just you can't have it both ways. Right. But is but but is it still not possible that Mitch McConnell himself is attempting? I mean, I don't want to use the word impartial with anybody in B.C. at this point, but um, is attempting to not be as partial in this particular impeachment. This is not a man, Mitch McConnell, who is shy about saying what he thinks. Do do either one of you read into the fact that he has stayed sort of I think saying that they are an impartial juror is a a way of not having to answer tough questions about whether they think what they think Trump did was wrong. And I think McConnell likes the idea of impartiality, but he's also, you know, voted to call, uh, you know, a trial that he postponed unconstitutional. It doesn't make any sense. Like, they're playing both sides of the table, which, you know, is politically, I guess, savvy, but is ethically highly questionable. Right, but he is a master. I mean, he's not a person I'd want to play chess with, Mitch McConnell. He may be, yeah, well, may, he it, may just, I may disagree with him on everything, but he knows how to play chess. He's a strategist, but I mean, it's it's a lot easier to be a creative strategist when you throw the rules out the window. Do you know what I mean? Right, like, but what yes. is his strategy long term? I guess because you guys it, stay on in the power. circus. You, on the circus, you guys have really been. I mean, especially last week, you talked about this rift. You're continuing to talk about this rift. Mark just said a minute ago, the big story is what's going to happen with Republicans. Um, you know, who's going li- to. Isn't Mitch McConnell a one of those people in the party who doesn't believe that the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Matt Gates, the Jim Jordans, the Trumpists of um, America are the right way forward for the Republican Party? Does he not have a motivation to want to try to rid Trump from his party? Yes, 100 percent. And that's why he stuck his neck out a couple of weeks ago. That's why he walked out on the plank. You know, but nobody followed him was the problem. Yeah, I mean, he's all, listen, McConnell's strategy is to stay in power. And he had a a reckoning in the month of January, which is he suggested that it was time to get rid of Trump from the Republican Party. There was quiet insurrection, both at the state level and at the federal level. And he basically said, okay, never mind. And that's why we are where we are. Uh, So he, so you, so if I'm asking you for surprises that might come to us in the next week, Mitch McConnell voting to convict would not be something that you'd have on your bingo card. Oh, no, he's not going to vote to convict. Do you think there are what, what other Republicans could we look for um, as as possible? Flippers, <laughs> I still think it's possible McConnell could, could vote to convict. I don't. Uh, Cassidy um, could. Right. Cassidy is would be a surprise, but I think basically it's going to fall along the lines of that Rand Paul vote that happened last week. I can't even remember. Right, but there are still a few outstanding folks, um, Republicans who have Rob Portman, Richard Burr, who have said Richard Shelby, even who have now said they're not running again. Um, yeah, uh, is Richard Shelby's announcement about of his retirement is the timing of that interesting to either of you at all? <laughs> You mean Rob Port, the Rob Portman Richard, announcement? Richard Shelby, Richard Shelby in Alabama just announced this week while you were on an airplane, Alex, um, <laughs> going somewhere <laughs> probably that he's not going to re- he's not going to run for re-election in Alabama in twenty two. Yeah. Um, so add him to the Rob Portman who we already knew wasn't going to run. Richard Burr who's not going to run in North Carolina here. Um, there are still a few people who don't really have any more butts to kiss. Correct? Yeah. So I mean, Portman would be a nice surprise, but but. You know, uh, it would be the Rob Portman that I knew when he worked for Bush. That's that's the guy I knew back then. Right. That's and who you talked to a, last week. And he's got a free show. pass now. So. So. So I guess I, I keep I'm keep begging either of you to tell me that maybe the Republican Party will not be owned by Donald Trump, as Marjorie Taylor Greene has told us it is. But it sounds like both of you think that it's probably Trump's party, like she says. Yeah. I think it definitely is. Look at if you have wit- lived through and witnessed the the proceedings of the last week, there has been a an excess of evidence to suggest that he is not fit to be a party leader. To say nothing of uh, his work as a president, right? And the Republicans are not taking the offer. <laughs> they are they are standing in line. The fealty has been pledged, and I think the that is born of um, you know political reality, which is that the base of the Republican Party, and not even the base, the vast majority of Republicans still support President Trump. And if that's where the voters are, the way they believe they stay in office is by staying where the voters are. And that's with Donald Trump. 
Well, I, I listen, I would say, uh, listen, I think Republicans are leaving in droves. I, I would say the base and not the vast majority. And I think that the I mean, the problem, the long term problem is that 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 McConnell saw is now availing itself and polling that I saw this morning that the 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 support for the Republican Party has dropped like 15 points in the last month. I mean, the support for Democrats is about 48 and it's like 37 for Republicans. So, you know, it's they're in a death spiral. This episode is sponsored by Apostrophe. Apostrophe is a prescription skincare company for people who are ready to take their acne seriously. Um, Prescription acne treatment really works, but it's sort of a pain in the butt to get. Um, If you got to take time off work, you got to go to a doctor, sit in line at the pharmacy, all that mess. Um, And, and, you know, if you've got it, it ain't that exciting to go out and be, be out in public and have everybody seeing you zit. So, you know, if you could do it, a little bit more privately, that would be nice. Hey, apostrophe came along. That's perfect. Um, with apostrophe, it's easy to see a board-certified dermatologist online, and you get treated immediately, and your medications get delivered straight to your house, so you don't have to go to the pharmacist and say, please give me my zit cream. Um, <laughs> all you have to do is fill out Apostrophe's online questionnaire about your skin concerns and medical history, and then just snap a few selfies, and a dermatologist will get right back to you with a customized treatment plan, and it'll be made just for you. The best part about it all is that Apostrophe offers topical and oral medications, and the oral medications treat the acne from the inside out and the outside in. Apostrophe treats acne, and they also help you with other skincare goals like reducing redness, wrinkles, even dark spots. At Apostrophe, it's nice to know that you had a real dermatologist and that your plan is customized for whatever you want to fix, and you don't even need to schedule an appointment. And I totally love that you don't have to go to the pharmacy during COVID to get your stuff. Uh, Their products feel great on your skin, and they just absorb nicely and have all the ingredients that you really know will work well. Get $15 off your first visit with a board-certified dermatologist at apostrophe.com slash heck, and use our code heck. (laughs) This code is only available to our listeners, because nobody else would choose that code. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash heck, and click begin visit, and then use the code heck. At sign up and you'll get $15 off your dermatology visit. That's A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash heck. And use that code heck to get your dermatology visit for $15 off or look for the link in our show notes. And we really want to thank Apostrophe for sponsoring the podcast. Um, so where do people like Adam Kinzinger and... and- <laughs> Liz Cheney Mark go. McKenna. I mean, you, they, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Where, where, where do they go? I mean, you're not, they're not going to really be able to make a second conservative party because that would just take, that would just guarantee Democrats wins, right? So, and they're, and, and if they move to Democrat, to the Democrat party, that's sort of disingenuous, right? Because, I mean, This tribalism, some of the, I mean, Lincoln Project right now is getting quite a bit of flack because of, you know, their practices. We don't need to go into that necessarily, but, but there has been some, there have been some people who switched parties and almost abandoned their conservative principles over their dislike for Trump. Well, Um, Clay, I'm a, I'm a good example, right? I'm an old Bush, compassionate, conservative Republican. I had my issues with Dick and it told me that Liz Cheney was being branded as a rhino in the Republican party. (laughs) You know, I thought we were on Mars, but, but, but but we are, but you know what I did this week? I maxed out to Liz Cheney. Mm -hmm. So to me, you know, Liz Cheney at least had a backbone and stood up and did the right thing, stood up on principle. I said, well, if that's, you know, if that, at least that's a, that's a start. And so, uh, you know, for people like me, I, I, you know, I hope that people line up behind Liz Cheney. What kind of calculation, by the way, is because she's the Cheney family, again, whether I agree with them or not, and I definitely don't tend to, they are pretty good political chess players. What kind of calculation is Liz Cheney and Ben Sass? What are they making? Because, I mean, they have to be... Uh, certainly well, a big part of it is principle, but isn't there a little bit of political calculation there too? Well, uh, y- yes and no. But, uh, what I would say about the Cheneys is, and again, I, I had my disagreements. I was not a Cheney fan on the ticket. I was, I wanted McCain to be on the ticket. 
uh, and told uh, then Governor Bush that. But um, um, I, I, just uh, uh, from an ideological perspective, I think the Cheneys are very, very conservative. But I think at the end of the day, I could see how Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney had a, had a, had a discussion about the country. You know, it mm-hmm. wasn't about the Republican Party or I mean, they care about the presidency. I mean, they're they're institutionalists and, you know, they have a real historical perspective. And, you know, say what you like want about Dick Cheney. He was not Donald Trump. You know, it wasn't about Dick Cheney. I mean, he had a, a strong ideology, but, you know, he, he was doing what he thought was best for the country, not best for him. It, it, but if if the Republican Party were smart enough savvy enough, whatever word, whatever adjective we want to go with, to nominate someone like Liz Cheney or Ben Sass, Alex, don't you think it would be a lot harder for Democrats to attack those two as dangerous to the country when in this period of time, even Democrats are kind of looking to them and going, thanks. Uh, it's all relative, right? I mean, you do remember that in 2012, Mitt Romney was the Republican nominee. Right, and Democrats know, had a right? lot to say about how he would take I know, the but, country. But how much do they regret danger- that now, I wonder? I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, no, I don't think they regret beating Mitt Romney and reelecting Barack Obama for another four years, at least Democrats, right? Um, so, uh, yes, having seen what lies on the on the other side, you know, having seen the depths of, of Trumpism, would they be more welcoming to a Romney, Cheney, Sass candidate? Sure. But I think if you actually look at where the Democratic Party is and where even, I, I guess we're calling Liz Cheney a centrist, which seems totally absurd. <laughs> but <laughs> Really? <laughs> <laughs> she's we, a, she's even, a patriotic Far right, right. <laughs> conservative. <laughs> like, but I'm, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is, if you look at the polit, that there is a huge political chasm between what Liz Cheney and Ben Sass think the country needs to do. When when you take Trump out of the equation, the the sort of platform that Cheney and Sass, um, you know, support is radically different than the vision, the American Social Compact that the Democrats would like to enact. So, but here's you know, some, not, here's, I, mean, here's, I think for a time it would be a pleasant change uh, to have someone who believes in the Constitution and institutions. But beyond that, I don't think you're going to get a kumbaya drum circle between, you know, especially the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and Ben Sass. But here's the problem for Republicans, Clay. The, there was a real opportunity if they'd been able to, you know, cut the head off the king, which is that when you look at 2020, if you take Donald Trump out of the equation, Republicans did very well. They way exceeded expectations. That They almost took the House. Um, and but they, how can you take did, Trump out of the equation on that? I mean, didn't, didn't they do that well because he was on the ticket? Because no, he was on the ballot? No, 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 no. They, they did not do well because he was on the ticket. They did well because people, America is really a kind of a, a, a you know, center-right country. And, but then what uh, happened in Georgia two months later, Mark? Well, I mean, the, the demographics have changed there, but that's, you know, it's still a 50-50 Senate. And, uh, you know, there, I mean, there was one point in the, you know, six months ago, we were talking about Democrats getting 55 seats in the Senate, 56 seats. Well, I mean, well, I, 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 mean, wanted, I think people here, are going to read. I, I, I take issue with that assessment. I mean, I think I think your point, Clay, is, is, a, is a good one to make. I mean, Trump motivates people to come out and vote. Right. You know, and he he, he may on have, both sides. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. And I think moderate conservatives who were disgusted by the four years of Trump went over to the Democratic side of the aisle. But I don't think we can look at the results of 2020 and say Republicans outperformed X. Ex- I mean, I wouldn't I, I would I would caution Republicans against reading too much into, you know, the brand being, you know, a good brand to keep standing behind heading into the next four years of American politics. Right. Mark, well, Mark, isn't, the, isn't part of the well, concern but, but, well, that let's Republicans press on have? That point a little bit. So. So Republicans almost won the House. How did that happen? Well, some people would argue that part of the reason that happened is because those folks who really love Trump, that Donald Trump's supporters, who typically had not voted in previous elections, came out to support him and then just circled the R's all the way down the ballot, right? Um, and, And perhaps the reason that two Democrats just won in Georgia for the first time in my lifetime um was because Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot and didn't get people out. Uh, now, the I reverse think, well, of that happened in, in Arizona because, you know, they just didn't like Donald Trump in Arizona. And so they voted for the Democrats in that state. But, but I, yeah. go ahead, Alex. 
I, I think that the House lesson is less about the Republican Party and more about the Democratic Party. If you hear mm-hmm. it from the Democrats who were defeated in the House, Mark, which ultimately gave the Republicans a, a, a better margin than expected in November, it's the, the their 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 cries were, "We swung too far to the left. We can't be talking about defund the police. You know, we have to rethink the the ways in which we talk about our agenda, if not reframe it. You know, significantly." So I, I'm not sure I take the House gains in terms of the Republican Party. I look at them in terms of the Democratic Party. Well, well that's a good point. That's a good point. But let, let me just say one other thing about that, which is when I say take him out of the equation, I meant that if if others had followed Trump, if they had imp- if they had convicted Trump and basically said, you're out of here, buddy, you no longer you know, are the leader of the Republican Party, then you'd go into 2022, which is typically a good year for the out of party party. Uh, without the hangover of Trump, and I and you could be, you know, there are a lot of what the on the policy prescriptions that the Republicans were happy about, but now you got you have the worst of both worlds. You you have you have you have Trump, uh, and you know, and and you have a situation where, you know, he's going to be out there banging the drum in 2022, and you know, given what we know now, that's I, I think I think it's quite possible that the Democrats will perform much better than they usually do in off-year elections. Right. Well, that's what Adam Kinzinger was just saying to um, Mark this week on your show, that, you know, this is a gift to a lot of yeah. Democrats, that that Marjorie Taylor Greene becomes the face of, yes, exactly. I mean, she becomes the Republican equivalent of what Republicans try to make AOC for Democrats, right? Exactly so right. I, I want to double click on that thing that you brought up, Alex, which was Democrats have the kind of have a little problem going on inside their house, too. It just didn't on the news every day right this minute because we're in the middle of a impeachment trial. Um, are Democrats going to be able to have that same Abigail Spanberger versus mm-hmm. uh, AOC battle? Um, uh, who's going to win that? Uh, I'm I'm sitting here in a, in a really purple state um, where I hear what Abigail Spanberger and and Connor Lamb had to say about their campaigns and agree with them. But there is a loud faction of the Democrat Party, which was also very successful this this last year. Cory Bush um, was elected. Uh, Jamal Bowman in New York uh, City was elected. Um, who, who's going to win that? And does Biden have the ability to keep the waters calm on the Democrat side so that they don't have problems in 22 themselves? I, I I will say here, I'm a lot more bullish on the Democrats being able to muddle through this and the Republicans because the big problem in the Republican Party beyond the sort of intra-party differences about what to do is misinformation. There is a poison that has spread throughout the ranks of the Republican Party. And that is the the conspiracy theories, the QAnons, I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene spouting 9-11 truther uh, ideas, you know, questioning the the whether Parkland was a false flag. Jewish that lasers, is, yeah, my Jewish space part. lasers. Yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can we just make tote bags my that say Jewish part. space lasers? But yeah. <laughs> you know, like that is that is uh, cancerous, right? And and the mendacity, the lies, the paranoia, the conspiracy that is woven into Republican politics at this point. And it is uh, a sort of foundation from which some people in elected office in their party spring. And that is incredibly dangerous. The same thing does not exist on the left. There are, you know, of course, left-wing websites, but the 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 sort of infrastructure of lies and the infrastructure of conspiracy and, you know, dark, unfounded theories has not penetrated the ranks of the Democratic Party in the same way that it has um, on the on the right. And so that's why I'm, I'm a sort of like a little bit more bullish on the Democrats being able to manage this. But you're right. Like, there's a gulf um, separating Abigail Spanberger from Ayanna Presley and Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Um, having said that, I've been really impressed at how unified the party has been. I mean, at the end of the day, they stood behind Joe Biden. <laughs> like, that guy is not yeah. part of the squad, right? Like, there is a sense of urgency and fear and terror that I think is uniting Democrats in the hour and will continue to un- unite them because but if they're, of— But if the terror is gone, presumably, if well, Trump is gone— Well, but I don't, th- I mean, I don't think— Well, but it's not just Trump. I mean, I think that there is a real, like, we can talk about the issues, but like climate, for example, there is a a horror 
about how much progress was rewound in the last four years and the fierce urgency of the moment to actually do something. And I think that is a very unifying force in the Democratic Party. And, um, you know, things like gun violence, immigration reform, there there are going to be differences. And I, I'm sure the prescriptions that, um, you know, some of the progressive left will offer are going to be very different than the centrist left. But at the end of the day, there is a real, real a shared sense of um, concern about really pressing issues. And I think that can tie the party together as ragtag as it is in a way that could, you know, help keep it together in the, in the, in the foreseeable future. Mark, Democrats, trouble? The whole Biden, uh, you know, the Biden, Biden winning that primary was just such a stunning 72 hours that we all remember from, you know, from, uh, from Nevada to South Carolina. And, you know, I, I just, Democrats should be, on their knees every day, praying to the political gods, uh, their thanks that Joe Biden was the nominee. I because am. I don't think, given <laughs> given given the outcome, I don't think anybody else would have won that election. And um, I listen. He's got what a you know sixty two sixty three percent approval rating, uh, which is really high. Uh, you know, Trump never got over fifty. I think that. Uh, I think a lot of, you know, Republicans who've just had the, you know, were, were scaremongered over the last four or five, six years about Democratic Socialists and what have you are looking at Biden. You know, he's 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 not that bad. And, you know, he's not he's he's he is a you know, I call him kind of the physician in chief. He's like a, you know, nice warm blanket with giving us a tea and a thermometer, checking our temperature, you know, and, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, not not doing major surgery here, but just, you know. Just just keeping keeping things calm. And um, so I think that's, that's been, strategic on his part, right? I mean, just oh, sort of trying to stay well, it's quiet. Strategic, it, it's strategic, but I think it's also who he is. You know, he was the man for the moment. He was just the right guy for for lots and lots of reasons. We could talk for hours about it. But, um, you know, the, the good news is that he has not been as some thought he would be, as some Republicans argue that he'd be pulled off the rails by the squad and others on the left. Does it make sense that the same company who controls half of online retail also eavesdrops on your private conversations at home? Hmm. What about the idea that a single company controls 90% of internet searches, runs your email service, gets to track everything you do on your smartphone? Big tech is way more powerful than most countries are, really. And they profit by going through your personal data. And it's time to put a layer of protection between your online activity and these tech juggernauts. And that's why I really recommend ExpressVPN. Think about how much your life is on the internet. I mean, sadly, every site you visit, the video you watch, the message you sent gets tracked and it gets data mined. Um, but when you run ExpressVPN on your device, the software hides your IP address. And that's something big tech uses to personally identify you. So ExpressVPN makes your activity harder to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data to keep you safe from hackers and eavesdroppers on your network. Encryption is incredibly important at keeping your stuff private so no one else can read it. Um, and ExpressVPN does all of this stuff without slowing down your connection. And that's why it's the number one rated VPN service by CNET and by Wired, two incredibly techy, brainy magazines. <laughs> what I like about ExpressVPN is how easy it is to use. All you got to do is download the app on your phone or your computer. You got to tap one button and bam, you're protected. So stop handing over your personal data to the big tech monopoly that mines your activity and sells your information. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep me safe online. Visit expressvpn.com slash heck. <laughs> There's a big surprise, right? That's E X P R E S S V P N dot com slash heck to get these three extra months for free. Go to expressvpn dot com slash heck right now to learn more or look for the link in our show notes. When when you started the circus, what is you and your you're in your sixth season? Now, what season is this now? Six? Six. Yeah. Six yeah. Six Did you I mean the name of the show was sort of perfect? In 2016, um, because it was absolutely a shit show circus. 
Um, did you have any idea that it was going to still be one <laughs> six years on? Um, well, or, or... Clay, I mean, not only did we didn't think it would be six years on, we didn't think it would be then. I mean, there was a lot of reaction to the name when it was first proposed. I mean, a lot of people freaked out and said, oh, that's way over the line. That's, you know, that's insulting to the process. And, and of course, we had no idea. And this was, you know, this was late 2015. And. I think Donald Trump was on the radar screen, but nobody nobody anticipated what was going to happen. And and by the way, when we conceived the show, it was really supposed to be about camp the campaign, right? So we thought we were right. going to be to 2016 and then be one and done. Maybe come back four years later, and then it was you know three weeks into the administration, and the suits at Showtime called up and said the circus hadn't stopped, keep going. And I and I was I was skeptical at first. I was like, it's Washington, it's static. How interesting could it be? And well, we discovered it was really, right? really fucking interesting. Well, that's what's fascinating to me. I mean, I enjoy it, but I, I, I think a lot of us thought, okay, once Trump is out, things are going to get a little bit boring. And I was well, ready for boring, but it hasn't. <laughs> we well, all were. <laughs> but it hasn't. Not only was I boring. ready for it, Clay, I, was, I would have been happy for Joe Biden to put us out of business. I mean, right. I, 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 uh, I assumed our ratings were going to fall off a cliff, but you know what? Last week was our highest radio ever, so, so Joe's doing pretty good. He's a ratings machine, as it turns out. But it's a, it is a, it's, it's not stopping. And you've both been following and po following politics and doing what you do for long enough. That it, is there an end to it? I mean, is there going to be a point? <laughs> is there a breaking point where? Uh, Either side finally says, okay, we got to stop the fighting. I mean, I know it's disingenuous for Republicans at this moment to be saying, oh, we need to not have an impeachment. We need to all get along. Yeah, give me a break. Um, uh, but, but is there a point, does Joe Biden have what it takes to actually get, take his 1985 Senate values and bring them into 2021 and get people to, to try to work together? Does he yeah, have no, that? No, he's not going to be able to do that single-handedly. There has to be some will, you know, to do that. And there isn't. You know, we we reward conflict in American politics. And a lot of the GOP brand right now is based on conflict. You talk to Republican voters, Republican candidates, Republican strategists. Being a fighter, quote unquote, is the brand. That's the DNA of the party right now. And that doesn't mean be, being a fighter does not mean crossing the aisle and working in a bipartisan fashion. So, uh, you know, until you have consensus on both sides that, you know, camaraderie is a goal, then I don't think you get away from the, the vitriol, the infighting, the brawling that's become a hallmark of American politics. You know, as yeah. far as the name, I, I like to- Damn it, Alex. Sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, I wish I, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, like, I mean, and I don't mean to be like, um, you know, holier than thou, but like we have a whole like infrastructure around politics that celebrates the trivial and the absurd. It's and like the, sports. Yeah, it has become sport. And I I think, you know, to some degree, like that can be compelling content, but it's, is it good for the country? And, you know, I mean, I don't think we're taking a long look at the sort of um, systems and institutions that have built up uh, that are predicated on conflict and celebrating it. Mark, you agree uh, or you have more hope for me? <laughs> I have more, I know I have more hope in it just in this sense. I, I don't disagree with anything that Alex said, but, but what I do think is happening, Clay, is that We've sort of had this national civics lesson over the last uh, four or five years. Uh, people came to recognize, you know, uh, for reasons of, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, almost existential reasons that they need to pay attention, or that that, and they want to pay attention. Uh, that the governments, you know, they they realize that government ha is there to do something, and that they can't just ignore it, and they can't be apathetic. And so they're interested, they're involved, they're activated. And so the reason I think that, again, you know, that, that people are still watching the show is that, I mean, we've kind of gone from, you know, a, a Stephen King movie to a, I don't know, a Hallmark movie. I mean, people are watching it more hopefully now, I think, because uh, they, they, you know, they are, I think a lot of Americans are like me, they're prisoners of hope and they just, they believe things are going to get better because they have to. I mean, I do think, as Alex said, the Republican Party DNA is just going to, you know, they're going to just, you know, claw their way to the bottom on this sort of, you know. Will they uh, split? Yes, I think it's, uh, yes, I think it's going to split. And that's, that's what, I, that's why I think, 
I, I think they'll probably won't do historically well, like uh, the out of party usually does in 2022. And I think they will lose the presidency in 2024 because the party's going to be split. You're going to have a Trump wing and you're going to have the other wing, whatever it is. But it's not going to be unified. I'll tell you that for sure. Well, damn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so we have some questions we ask listeners to uh, to write in, um, and they've known that you guys were coming. They had a lot of questions for both of you, but this one um, comes from Melissa in Arlington, Virginia, um, and it's for either one of you. Is there any hope that senators may be absent and lower the threshold to reach the two-thirds majority required for conviction? Oh, that's a good hopeful question, but probably not, Melissa. I don't think that many of them are going to call out sick tomorrow. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, that they, 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 you know, voting no or voting yes is one thing, but saying, you know, that you uh, you took a six day on the vote for impeachment would be a tough one to defend. It's also essentially the same as voting to convict. I mean, at that point, if you are the if you are Marco Rubio and you say I'm not showing up, then you might as well just shown up and voted to convict, correct? Yeah, they, they think this vote is going to haunt. They think this vote is going to haunt them in the years or months to come. So they're going to be there. Okay, um, Alex, uh, this one's for you. Carrie from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Democratic Party is old. Who are its next leaders? We all know about the squad. Who's bringing home the middle? Oh, I, I, I actually think there's like, a, I, I think there's actually a great bench in terms of age on both sides. I mean, I think, you know, everyone from, you know, the Keisha Lance bottoms is to the world. I don't think you've heard the end of the, you know, Pete Buttigieg. I think you have um, like people like Eric Garcetti waiting in the wings. Maybe people don't think that he's like the bright shining star, but he there there is a lot of talent that's like Northern in middle. their 30, 40. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what about the ones you know, who were, what about these impeachment managers who we all yeah, just got introduced to say, this week? Joe, Joe Nagus. Nagus, like definitely a star. There's a, there's a reason he was making the penultimate argument uh, for the impeachment managers. He was fantastic. Um, you know, I think names like, you know, Eric Swalwell ran for president, didn't make much of a dent, but he's clearly got a lot of ambition. There, there, there are a number of people that haven't become, you know, household names yet, but are absolutely, I think, being groomed for leadership positions beyond, you know, the four women we know in the squad. There, there are a lot of people that looked at the Trump years. I mean, to Mark's point about being a prisoner of hope, there are a lot of people that lived through the last four years, realized that the stakes are incredibly high, and got involved in politics. And that should give us hope more than anything else. Like, we are breeding a new generation of uh political leaders who genuinely believe in change. And that is exhilarating. True. And, and by the way, Clay, I, I, I think this shit out so- of the park this week, right? Oh, yes. And like in a cape. I mean, amazing. Yes. <laughs> she was incredible. <laughs> right. OK, Mark, what were you saying? Sorry. Well, I just was going to say that I think that this is something that Biden takes very seriously, too. He knows he's old. I think he I mean, he said publicly that uh, or out loud that he intends to be a transitional figure. And by that, I think he means that he intends to really groom and support a younger generation of leadership in the in the Democratic Party, because you're right. I mean, you look at the leadership at the top, Schumer, Pelosi, Biden. I mean, they are ancient. But I think Biden gets that. And I think that's why you see, you know, Pete Buttigieg and people like that at cabinet level positions. There there is a bench there. Uh, they just haven't had a seat and Biden's given it to him. Yeah, okay, like well, John John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, nobody knew who they were until like four weeks ago. And I guarantee you, you're going to be hearing more from those two men in the coming months. Well, related to what you just said, Mark, will Trish from Long Island uh, asks, will the Democrats be able to find a message after Trump? The Republicans, you mean? Well, no, she asked Democrats specifically. Um, but by all means, please ask, please answer about Republicans. Um you're you're a messaging guy, regardless. Um, <laughs> I think I think I guess what you, I guess Trish, forgive me if I'm getting your question, interpreting your question wrong, but I'm assuming it sounds like Trish thinks Democrats have spent a lot of time talking about Trump. Um, no, that's a great point. So listen, uh, that's, that, it's a great question. I mean, the reality is that a, a big part of the message, whether it was explicit or not, was. Uh, it, it was a vote against Trump and not necessarily a vote for Biden. Biden didn't, it didn't excite a lot of people, but Trump did on both sides, as Alex mm-hmm. said. So, so the vote for Joe Biden was really more a vote against Donald Trump. So, so you're right. The, the Democratic Party has to do a, a, a solid job in the next couple of years of doing, you know, of avoiding what Alex was talking about, which is, you know, the whole defund police. And they, they can't, 
they just have to be very careful not to confirm what Sean Hannity is going to be saying on this television show every night, which is that we just handed over the presidency to a bunch of socialists in the Senate. Uh, and, you know, but I think there was, I think the there world's were a lot crappiest of lessons... socialists, by the way, <laughs> just right. no good at it. No good at it. <laughs> good. Yeah, <laughs> uh, exactly. So I think that there were lessons learned and, you know, uh, Democrats spend some time in the desert. And when you do that, you learn where to find water and they found water in Joe Biden and, and, and where his politics are and, and his demeanor and his temperament. And I think, I think, I think a lot of people in the party said, we won for a reason, uh, and it wasn't, you know. And, and, and but we got we have to look beyond Trump now, and 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 be careful not to get you know get distracted as Democrats often do because it's a party of a thousand constituencies. Um, Alex Nikki from San Francisco wanted to ask you why do both parties seem to find it so awkward to speak to Asian Americans? Uh, I think it's not even awkward so much as they just don't. And as an Asian American, I have been approached. I have been involved to some degree in trying to better understand why that is, because they are a very fast growing uh, demographic in the United States. They vote, they have power of the purse. Um, and yet, first of all, like, I mean, now is just a critical moment for Asian Americans in part because, you know, Trump did a lot of groundwork in sowing the seeds of bigotry against Asian Americans by repeatedly talking about the China virus. There has been an uptick in violence directed at Asian Americans. There's, you know, I mean, it, it's a very difficult time to be an Asian American in a lot of ways in this country, politically speaking. You're not spoken to. And when you are spoken to, there's a lot of hatred that's that's sent your way. So, I mean, I think this is this is, you know, this is ultimately about reconciling a changing America. You know, the, the way we think of what America looks like is is radically different than it was 20 years ago. And um, I, I think as we get more and more used to the demographic change that is at our doorstep, the, the more we will be able to see who we need to be including in our political conversations. And look, I would also say it's up to Asian Americans, too, to, you know, get involved, be vocal and get angry when people don't talk to you. <laughs> Not actually angry, but you know what I mean? Like, don't don't stand don't don't stand by. Um, uh, I, I think that we, we are at a critical, like a, a critical hinge point in terms of um, being more inclusive as a political system and as political media as well. Okay, um, there's one, uh, there's a whole bunch, but I'm, we don't have time for too many, so I'm going to ask this last one of both of you. It's written for Mark by a guy named Ron from Billings, Montana, and I just find it to be the most interesting question. I don't know why it's fascinating me. What state has the most responsive and responsible government? Hmm, that's a good one. Well, Alex, jump uh, in if you don't, if you have one too. I mean, that's, um, those are two such different things. Well, <laughs> I think. I, I, listen, I, I, let me just talk about Colorado because that's where I'm living now, and that's where I was raised. And and I'll, I, I'm going to make this narrow rather than broad. Uh, one of the things that we I, I've 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 looked at and studied. Uh, election and election reforms for years and years and years. And it's, it's just been a, a topic of interest to me. Um, and so, I, you know, the, the notion of, you know, systemic voter fraud is something that I, I, I've thought a lot about and I, and I have done research on. And so I was really excited when I got to Colorado, which has very progressive uh, voting uh, reforms in place, including and especially uh, mail balloting. And so when this when all this began to when Donald Trump began to, you know, talk about, you know, the, the danger of mail in ballots and the, you know, the fraudulent system that we're, you know, it's gonna happen because of COVID, which is because of him, of course, mostly because he didn't handle it well. But we had to, you know, a lot of states had to enact what Colorado's been doing for a long time. But we 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 did a a segment on the show about the Colorado mail in ballot system. And it's it's phenomenal, Clay what they do there and how well it works. And it, this is, you know, this is a big surprise. It was a surprise to me uh, when I discovered that 98% of people in Colorado vote by mail, 98. And mm. uh, the, and, and it, and it works flawlessly. And uh, most of the votes come in before. So they're counted before election night. So you don't have these situations like this election where they're counting days and days after the election. It's all done by like eight o'clock. And the, you know, the Conservative Heritage Foundation, which is very conservative, uh, s spent a, a ton of money 
to investigate voter fraud in the, in the mail balloting system in Colorado. <laughs> and they studied 16 million votes over seven years. And you know how many uh, examples of voter fraud they found? Two. <laughs> Nine. Nine. Yeah. And that was yeah. that was McKinnon and his dog trying to vote <laughs> yeah. a couple times. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was some Magoo out there that just had like the wrong address or, you know, I mean, in, in every case, they're just accidental screw ups. They're not some, you know, they're not some sinister character out there, you know, ballot harvesting, you know, with you know a bunch of <laughs> Russians behind them. It's just no, that it's just, the ballot it, harvesting tends to happen in my home state, in North Carolina. That's oh yeah, we, yeah, we yeah, do that yeah. here. Oh, and it was yeah. Republicans. It was Republicans. Yes, it was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that's just. I mean, it's a good example of, of of government doing what it's supposed to do, doing it really well, kind of being a you know ahead of the curve on this issue. And I, I you know, every state will be doing what Colorado does hopefully sometime very soon and we will eliminate a lot of the problems that we saw this cycle mm. i have an answer to the question yeah. if you want clay please and it, it's not gonna shock anybody i've spent more time in the state of georgia over the course of the last year than i ever thought possible i actually told john ossoff i might be looking into buying a house there and moving my family <laughs> down there uh and i would not have said this in 2018 when there was of course like a, a huge shadow i mean stacy abrams uh, was very concerned about whether the election had been fraudulent or not. And, uh, you know, going with the with that in the background, I think a lot of people were very trepidatious about what would happen in 2020. And man, oh man, Brian Kemp, Brad Raffensperger, Gabe Sterling, the people tasked with counting those votes did everything by the book. They were under an enormous amount of scrutiny. And then they were subsequently under pressure from the president of the United States. And they stood firm. And I think when we talk about a state that is acting responsibly, to be responsible is to obey the will of the voters. And that is exactly what the state of Georgia did. And I would also say in terms of being responsive, you know, D Georgia's changing. The Georgia electorate is fired up. It's motivated. It's going to the polls like never before. We're seeing communities that are traditionally disenfranchised or non-participatory actually going out there, making their voices heard. That's all good for democracy. So my heart, uh, my political heart <laughs> lies in Georgia. I, I, at this I hour. definitely agree to give those those folks their props for being having the integrity. I will say that I was a little bit jealous. I did think that North Carolina would go blue before Georgia did. Mm. We did it in 08, but we haven't since. So we, we'll we'll get There's there. There's always next year. <laughs> we'll get there in, in a few years. Um, one question I have about the show, when you are determining who to talk to, what type of of conversations do you have when it comes to discussions about do we try to interview someone who is a big newsmaker but might not deserve the platform? I mean, do you have you had conversations about trying to get Marjorie Taylor Greene on as a as a guest? And do those conversations end up covering do we want to give a platform to someone who is talking about Jewish space lasers? Um, how do you guys have those discussions about who to talk to? Well, we um, wouldn't give her, yeah. We wouldn't let her talk about Jewish space lasers. Right. <laughs> I think is probably the well, answer to that. It, it's, a, it's a good question, Clay, because, I mean, we've, we've gotten a, a lot of, you know, of, uh, we've gotten criticism from people when we have Steve Bell on Stone. And my view is, I want to know what those people are thinking. I want to know what they're saying. I mean, I don't, you know, if you put them under, you put them in a cave, they're out there doing stuff. Right. They're out there scheming. They're out there trying to overturn elections. And I want to know about it. And I want people to know about it. So I, I just completely disagree with the notion of, you know, I mean, I, you shouldn't give them a platform just to give them a platform uh, to, to spew crazy conspiracy theories. But uh, but I also I want to shine, shine a light on these folks. Oh, I mean, you're sure going to get me to disagree. Them. We we do our best here. We've had Tommy Laren on. We've had we've had people who I vehemently disagree with, and we have healthy conversations, sometimes animated, but healthy conversations. And um, and, but I but I do know that there are so many folks who who watch both your show, any any news show, who will get very upset if too much exposure is given to some of some of the people who they disagree with who they think should not be able to have that platform but you well, I mean you push back on them Alex you push back yeah, and say show me the space back. lasers I mean, let me see I'm, yeah well I'm a journalist you know and I don't I I mean I I pride myself on asking people tough questions maybe sometimes I'm too harsh when I ask them questions but our job is not to get up here and engage in you know sort of hey geography or offer them you know a rose uh, give a rose tinted lens 
to their views. I mean, I think the the point of the circus is to show sort of the unvarnished um, reality of things. It's different than a lot of political news coverage. And sometimes truth is uncomfortable, but that's the sort of point of all of it. You know, we're documentarians and um, you can't pretend that the world is the way you want it to be. We want to show the world as it is. And and I love the fact that you use the word documentarian because if you if you're listening and you haven't watched the circus because I told you last time you really needed to, then you really better listen to me this time and go and go find it. <laughs> it's worth honestly, it's worth the Showtime subscription it just is. for this show because it's it is a documentary. I mean, it's it, it's it's almost um, uh, cinema verite when when you guys have your conversations about what's going on in this particular week and who you want to talk to, and the conversations are, you know, I love that they're very rarely, very rarely in a studio. You are out in the world with people talking to real people, talking to lawmakers, talking, and and the conversations and the inter- interviews that that you get on the circus are far less produced than elsewhere. And I think you get more of an unvarnished look at what people are thinking. Mark, when you talk to Rob Portman, you know, you've got that friendship with him. When you, you know, when you guys go out and speak to these folks, all all four of you are out there making sure, that, I mean, you're really getting good conversations with people. So if if you don't watch The Circus already, please go find it. I think that you could probably get, at the very least, a 15-day trial of Showtime um, to try out the circus for two weeks, and then you'll probably want to stick with it. So, um, <laughs> Thank you for doing do. that work, Clay. Thank yeah. you for doing that work. <laughs> well, it's worth it. I mean, it's it's one of the... I think we're... I stopped watching the news for a good chunk of last year, just turned it off. Um, <laughs> because I just couldn't handle 24 hours of news. It's a yeah. lot. But with a show like yours, you do get like you don't have to. Win. That's the other thing. It is a feat of magic that you can pull it off and turn it around in the amount of time that you do. But you're not waiting for you know three four weeks to get the story. You guys really do turn it around fast. So it's one of the few news store news shows that's that's both entertaining and educational and and you know just real. Um. So if you're listening and you haven't watched it, damn it. <laughs> they ain't got no more hosts for us to bring on, so you better start watching it now. <laughs> so, um, honestly, thank you so much, Mark McKinnon and Alex Wagner, um, for for being on and being with us this week. Uh, uh, I got to ask you, how the heck are we going to get along? Yeah, well, I'm the prisoner of hope. We just got to Clay. We got to kick it hard and carry on, regardless. Sounds fine to me. Uh, Alex <laughs> Wagner, Mark McKinnon, um, Showtime's The Circus. Please uh, check it out. Subscribe. It's on demand. It's on Showtime. It's on Showtime anytime. You can stream it online. You can get it on your Hulu or whatever the hell you're watching your shows on the Apple TV. Um, Mark McKinnon, Alec, McKinnon, Alex Wagner, thank you so much. Next week. You're a great pitch um, man, Clay. <laughs> thank you, Clay. Thank you, Clay. Yes. yes. Thanks again, y'all.